we're starting a new series, of, uh, a series of mini, but not mini messages, it's a mini series of messages uh, from the book of Philippians, uh, four chapters in the book of Philippians, called Joy No Matter What, we're beginning that this morning. As I shared in my uh, email on Friday, uh, I had shared some prayer requests on Facebook and through the uh, email, and one uh, individual had said, gosh, it sounds like there's a whole lot going on. You might want to share that message that you did, uh, share a little bit more about pain and suffering, and uh, you know, kind of thing. And it was, it was just interesting, that comment, because I tend to set out my messages and my series pretty, pretty well in advance, so that I can begin to think through thoughts and, and put things together. And so this Sunday, uh, I had already planned on talking about the issue of having joy in suffering. Yesterday, I had uh, the privilege with my wife of visiting uh, with Fran and uh, Paul at Dantramont, and uh, just, you know, talking with them. And as we were talking, Paula shared a little bit of uh, her story, some of which you may know, some of which you may not know. But I, I thought it just fits so well into what we're going to talk about um, from God's Word today that I wanted to give her an opportunity to share a little bit of that with you today by way of introducing where we're going. Another thing, in the program this morning, on the back of the insert, you're going to notice it says medical supplies. One of the things that, that you may not know is that for a number of years, Paula served as our, our church nurse, our parish nurse, and um, worked uh, to create a place and, and supplies for people who have uh, need durable medical equipment, um, need certain medical supplies, it's downstairs. And so those things are available to you, and, and they happen in large part because she had a passion for health and a passion for you. And so, um, so, so that's available to you, and that's information for you. But one of the things that happened in her life that happens with many of us is uh, the Lord led her into a time where she had some, if you would, health challenges. And so, um, so Paul, could you just could you just say perhaps a little bit about? Um, the journey that God took you on in terms of your health challenge and how that co connects to perhaps a real life for life and that, that situation that we'll talk about the relationship. I'm going to have to give you some guidance there. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll lead you along. Uh, I think most of you realize that uh, back some years ago, back in 1981, I had breast cancer. Um, and the Lord took me into some bad times at that point. I wasn't sure where I was going, uh, what was going to happen. But as you see, I'm still here. It's right? yeah. been too many years. Uh, and I oftentimes wondered why was God putting me through this. Uh, going through breast cancer isn't too difficult, but when they give you two years of chemotherapy, it becomes very difficult. I had a long time, long haul, and I came out on the other side as well, and I've not had any problems since. But I kept looking at it in terms of why did God put me through this? It was a tough time for my husband and my girls and myself. But through it all, uh, I came to know a very special person, and her name was Lou. And I don't know, I know some of you sitting here remember Linda. And Linda was uh, somebody that I knew through a relative, and she wasn't the sort of person that I would particularly want to be friends with. Uh, and I'm not that sort of person. You know me. I love, love everybody. But Linda, I did not love. Uh, but shortly after she left my view, my husband came home one day and said, I just saw Linda, and Linda has breast cancer. Well, I guess you know that put me in a different spot. Um, and so I went down and I talked to Linda. Uh, I really didn't want to because I didn't like her. Um, and and I, so I to say that as a Christian. But she and I became best friends. And I can remember the night that, several nights, when she called me 11 o'clock at night, Paul, we got the coffee on, I'm thinking, coffee at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> Um, and so Linda would come over and we would talk. And one night I was putting on my final cup material to 
Yes, my Sunday school class. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I teach a Sunday school class. I'm going to come down and help you tomorrow. I thought, oh my. Linda <laughs> <laughs> came down and Granny said to her, I will give you 50 cents this week. I'll double it every week that you continue to come to help her. Well, guess what? Linda never stopped coming. She fought her battle. She died for her battle. She died at my house. We took care of her. And it was just a very special time because she came to know the Lord. And the Lord gave me that opportunity to minister to her as well as her mother in law. And a lot of other people along the way. But I shared that say a whole lot or lead you uh, to say anything. But one of the things we're going to see today, and I think Paula's story is such a beautiful illustration of it, and it is an illustration that, that many of you can share in, and hopefully will share in after we look at what Paul has to say today, and that is that God, God's desire for us, and uh, our first response tends to be to ask why. Why me? Why this? Why that? How come? And, and what I think Paula realized as we were talking yesterday, and what I hope we will realize today, is that there are much better questions to ask with regard to the challenges, uh, the sufferings that God brings into our life. And because of what God did in Paula's life and how he led her, she was able to be a blessing and she was able to be a source of comfort and to see God change the life of a friend that she didn't necessarily like at the beginning. But God transformed that life and the life of her, was it her mother-in-law? Her mother? Her mother-in-law. Um, they came to Christ. And, and I wanted you to hear that because that's an illustration of where we're going to go this morning. And I thank you for sharing your heart and for your ministry here, and for, for letting us share the encouragement of God's work through you. And so, uh, I think to go ahead. Now I have to eat all these spoons. That's it. Yeah, well, we're going to figure that out, hopefully, um, as, as things uh, continue on for you and for your changes. Let me, Amanda, can I ask you to help Paul get to back there to, uh, to Franny? And let me invite you uh, to take out the message guide this morning as we uh, look to the Word. Um, so as I said, we're in week number one of this series called Joy No Matter What. And um, uh, we're going to begin to unpack some situations uh, four particular situations over the next uh, few weeks where, where God enables us and desires for us to have joy in the midst of them. And the first is, as you've probably already guessed, the issue of, of joy and suffering. You know, joy in the midst of the challenges, joy in the midst of the hard times. Um, if, if you're visiting, if you're new here today, uh, gosh, I hope, I hope this is, well, I, I, I just hope that this will speak to your heart. Uh, that will speak to all of our hearts with regard to God's work and His desires for us. But we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, it's page 1042, uh, if you want to use a pew Bible, and those are available before you there. It's also going to be on the screen behind me. It's in the message guide there, and you can follow along in that way too. Um, to understand the book, and we're going to be, we're going to be kind of unpacking the entirety of the book over these next weeks, we really need to understand what's called the context the context of the book of Philippians. And so I want to take a few moments here to, to explain to you the context or the backdrop, the backstory of this book. Because if we understand the backstory, it will help us understand the things that we're reading. It will help us understand the mindset of Paul as he shares these thoughts with the people in Philippi. And so, so the more we understand about what's going on during this time and, 
and when it was written, and why it was written, and, and the circumstances of the individual writing it, uh, the better we are able to, uh, to piece together what, what it is that God is trying to say to us here, and what's trying to be communicated. So a couple of important things that I want you to see this morning with regard to the context. And the first is this. The first is this. The Apostle Paul founded the church in Philippi on his second missionary journey. Second missionary journey. So Paul was, was involved in these missionary journeys, these endeavors to go out and to share the news of Jesus Christ in places and with people who have not heard it before. This is the second such time that Paul has gone out to do this. And so about uh, 52 AD, most scholars feel, 20 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul goes out and he lands in Philippi, a city. Um, and at this point, the church is up. He plants the church. It's going great. It's doing well. Uh, it's perhaps the church that many would feel that Paul, if it could be said appropriately, he, that he just loved them the most. That he just really cared for them. In fact, in, in the letters that we have of Paul here in the New Testament, as he shares with them, and as he gives the, the introduction to those letters, in each of the cases that we see here, in each of those books, we see that he addresses them, and he speaks this way. He talks about, uh, about Paul being an apostle. He, he begins by revealing that he has the office of apostle. Paul, an apostle, he would say. It simply means, apostle just means sent one. And so this sent one, Paul, Paul, an apostle, he was literally a, a church planter, if you would. And he would go from place to place, planting churches, setting them up, and then moving on to the next place once they were stable in order to, to spread the gospel and to plant the seeds of Jesus in these different places. And so what we see is he sends these letters all throughout that, are, that we find here in the New Testament. And he says, Paul, an apostle. But when it comes to the book of Philippians, it's interesting because this is the one and only letter that we have that he does not refer to himself that way. He refers to himself and he says, a servant of Jesus Christ, a slave. And so there's this unique relationship with this church that he founded during this second missionary journey that is different in some ways than those other churches. The second thing I want you to see here is that Paul writes this as a thank you note. It's a thank you letter to the Philippians. Some time ago, I shared with you and we talked about a gentleman by the name of Epaphroditus. About 10 years passed between the start of the church and when this thank you note, if you would, is sent. And Epaphroditus delivered a very generous offering from the Philippians to Paul. Now Paul, you have to understand, is a very interesting kind of quote, missionary, or church planter. Uh, he was one who was not given to be a, a he was not necessarily a, a good receiver, he was a great giver. He, he, he was not in the habit of taking money. Uh, if in, in the parlance of, it's not necessarily the most up-to-date way to say it, but Paul was, was largely a tent maker. He would go to a city to plant a church, and he would earn a living there in the city working while planting the church. He wasn't relying on other people in order to support himself. But here in this case, he receives this love gift from the Philippians. And, and the response to that and his closeness, in response to the closeness that he has with these believers, uh, and, and the blessing that it was to be loved by them, he sends back this note through this gentleman from the church named Epaphroditus. The third thing I want you to see is this. The Apostle Paul shows the depths of his love for the Philippians. Now, one of the things that I do each week that's a part of, well, most weeks, is provide for you a little way for you to kind of take the message to the next step over the course of the next five days or so called building spiritual strength. One of the things that I want you to do over these weeks is I want you to explore the book of Philippians in ways and in certain places that I'm not going to hit on Sunday morning. I'm talking, I'm doing a chapter a week. So that's pretty broad in terms of the scope. But doing it and using the building spiritual strength will allow you to look at some things and to read through those chapters uh, in a little more depth, ask some questions. And one of the things that I believe you that you will see there is, is Paul's uh, enduring love, his great love for the Philippians. We're going to see that here in chapter 1, this, this love for these people. 
And, and I want you to explore that in the devotionals that are on the back. This overflowing love of Paul and of God for them. Finally, let me suggest this, uh, letter T, and this is perhaps the most important for our study this morning, and it's this, that the Apostle Paul writes the book of Philippians from a Roman prison while he is awaiting potential execution. Everything that we study, that we look at, look at it kind of needs to have this, this particular thought in mind, particularly in chapter 1. Paul is here, he is in chains, 24 hours a day, in a Roman prison, chained to guards. According to Acts chapter 28, if you were to go over there and, and, and look there, um, he is there at least two years in prison. And so for two years, day by day, he is chained to Roman soldiers, a prisoner in jail, unsure if today is the day that he would be executed. And the interesting thing is, as, as you saw in the, the, the title slide for this, one of the things that, that people agree upon with regard to this book largely is that this book is about joy. How many of you, spending two years chained in a prison, it doesn't sound like a very joyful experience to me. In fact, I find that there are many things that enter my day or my week that are hardly worthy of consideration that steal my joy all the time. The person that goes slow in front of me when I'm trying to get somewhere. The fact that I can't find my favorite whatever in a store. You, you name it, you figure it out, but it is for you. But Philippians is characterized by the thought, and it's crazy. Joy. Joy. Paul always wanted to preach in Rome. It's one of the things that we know about him. And here he is. And rather than being free to go out and to preach in the streets and to found a church in Rome, what he finds himself doing is he finds himself incarcerated and in jail and unable, if you would, to go out and preach and, and to do what it is that he thought he should be doing. Rome, the center of, world, and of the world at the time, is a key place to spread the gospel. If he could infect people, if he could share the gospel there, this would be a central place for him and for the word to be spread out into the Roman Empire, into the Roman world. One of the things that we talked about that was unique about this particular time was the Pax Romana, was the idea of the Roman peace and the ability to go and to come, the development of highways, quote unquote, air quotes, highways and byways where things could be moved around easily particularly ideas and the truth of Jesus. And so Paul saw this as a very important place, but where is he? He's not out on the streets. He's in fact in prison. He doesn't go there as a preacher, he goes as a prisoner. In some sense you might say his greatest expectation has been ripped from him. He's in the right place, but he's not in the right place. And yet, in the midst of this, he writes this amazing, joyful thank you note. There are probably some of you here today who are hearing what I'm saying and you say, man, that's me. That's me. I thought I was going to show up as one thing and I showed up as another. I thought I was going to be in one place and I'm in a completely different place. If only the things, the circumstances, the situations in my life were different. If only this hadn't happened or that hadn't taken place. If only I had made a different choice. Things would have gone a different way. I would have thought perhaps at this point in my life I would be here, but down the where I'm at. I'm still stuck. These nagging thoughts. How many of you have nagging thoughts? You have nagging thoughts. And they just stick with you and you can't seem to beat them, you can't get beyond them. I mean, let's, if, if I was to ask you today, and I'm asking this rhetorically, if I were to ask you today if there were things that you would talk about or be honest enough to say in your life that you wish were different and that you could change and went the way they are, would you raise your hand? Let me say, yeah, that's me. 
That's me. I wish that wasn't true in my life. I wish I hadn't had that experience. I wish I wasn't living in light of that. And here we have Paul. Writing a book about joy. Living in the midst of suffering. A man who wanted to show up in, in the, the key city of the world at that time and preach and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them so that they might know him. And rather than being a preacher, he ends up a prisoner. If I had a 
if I have dogmatized, it will be much more likely that I will see what he is doing rather than just view it as a tragedy. For the untrained ear, what I've just heard, the news that I've just received, sounds like a tragedy. But with a spiritual ear, perhaps I would hear it different than just what's on the surface. Paul says here what? That what he endured and what he was going through served to further the advance of the gospel. This is why Paul's story is so powerful to me, and I was just like, would you be willing to share it? Because, because her similar situation with this lady, with whom she really wasn't friendly, gave her an experience through which she could then relate and be a source of ministry and comfort and care. And it ended up being something through which the gospel was furthered because she came to know Christ. It's interesting the word that's used here. Some of you are word people. I like word people. I tend to be a word person. Today you're going to get to be a, word, a Greek word person. There's a word here. It's prokope. Prokope. So rather than write the definition, I'm going to let you write the Greek word. Prokope. It's a word that means to advance. To advance. It's the idea of a pioneer advance. It's the progress of an army or an expedition. It's like being the expeditionary force. It's like being the person who goes in there first and clears away stuff, clears away the undergrowth, gets rid of all of the stuff that's in the way so that, so that as the rest of the things come through, they can go through unimpeded. That's what's happening here. Paul is saying, I'm clearing the way, and the things that are going on in my life are clearing the way for Christ, for his word to be preached more clearly. It continues on, this is verse 13, it says this, so that it may become evident to the whole palace guard, to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What's he saying here? I've been chained up 24 hours a day with these guys. They can't escape me. If I was preaching out on the street, I could be preaching to nobody. Here I am. I've got these guys with me 24 hours a day for approximately two years. And they've got, they, there's nothing they can do but listen to me preach the gospel. The gospel has been furthered because of my chains. He goes on to say, and because I have been bold in my faith, brothers and those who are out there who are out on the streets are able to be much more bold and are able to preach the gospel boldly. And God's begun to work. Listen, the stuff that happens in your life is never without purpose. Never without purpose. God's desire is to do something through it. And the greatest thing that he does through it is that it serves for the furtherance of the gospel. It's an expeditionary experience that clears the way so that the gospel can go through. Many times the pain and the suffering that we go through is so that we can get out of the way so God can do what it is that he needs to do. Because quite honestly, sometimes we're just in the way. And so he kind of cleans us up, he wakes us up, he shakes us a little bit, he gets our focus back on him, and then he begins to do, to do a, a great work. Who are the most key individuals in terms of the Roman situation? Quite honestly, I, I mean, it was, the, it was the armed forces. It were the armies who kind of kept that Pax Romana. It were the individuals, the way to impact is through the leaders. And those soldiers, those individuals were leaders. They were the, they were, every, every six hours, history tells us, those individuals would change. Four groups of individuals every day over the course of 700 plus days. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of preaching. That's a lot of impact. Today's transforming truth, at least the first of them is this, is that God can change your setback into a setup. God can set up some amazing things some amazing gospel situations through what you look at as a setback. God can change a setback into a setup by the way that we approach it. If we choose to ask why, we focus on ourselves. If we choose to ask what, we focus on Him and what He's doing, His purposes. 
That very thing that you wish you could change, that's the very thing that God is going to use to perhaps do an amazing thing in the life of someone else, and certainly your own. Paul wasn't an ordinary prisoner, and you're no ordinary prisoner. You're a prisoner, and he was a prisoner with a purpose. And God wanted him to do something great. So the first thing we do is we ask, is, is, is we're going to ask, now what? Now what? Paul says, now what? Now what? Not why, but what? The second thing is this, is we're going to say, so what? Oh, sorry. I got told, just, I'll catch up. <laughs> is that I'm going to ask the question, now what? But then I'm going to say, so what? Accompanied with the, the now what has to be the so what? <clears throat> These two are, are, are put together. On things that don't really matter, you don't have to just say, so what? Not everything is a big deal. Not everything is, is, is monumental. There needs to be alignment that you draw when you say, you know what, this really doesn't matter. I don't need to, I, I'll find this more and more. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just finding that there is more and more that I don't need to speak to. I don't need to make a comment about it. I don't need to reply to it. I need to just let it go. So what? Now, follow me. There are some things you can't say so what about. There are some things that are part of being, as we were talking in the information class this morning, there are some things that are part of being one anotherly being in community, being in the body of Christ, being connected, being in community, that you just can't say so what to. But there's a lot of stuff that I think we think is important that we can just quite frankly just say so what. You just need to let it go. Don't bury it. Don't, don't bear that burden. Let it go. To understand this at the time that, that Paul is, is, is going through, while Paul was in prison, there are a lot of other guys who, if you would, have taken up the street corners. And they're out there preaching now. You know? And, and some of those guys are not preaching for the most pure of motives. They're preaching for profit. And this is what Paul has to say about that situation. Verse 15, it's where it begins, it says this. It says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. He says there are some that are good, some that are bad. He said the former, those first ones, preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. He says they're out there and they're doing it for the wrong reason, and it just makes my chains even harder to bear because of why they're doing it, and, and they're, they're just, it's just making the situation worse. But the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, the later, the latter do it. These brethren are out there because they're excited about the fact that God's on the move and they're sharing the true gospel and they're not doing it for themselves, they're doing it for the beauty of the kingdom. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. He says, you know what, people are out there for bad reasons, good reasons, and he says, you know what? Christ is being preached, preached. I wish it wasn't the way it was, but in the end, he says, what does it matter? Christ is being preached. And here's your second Greek word for the day. Actually, it's three Greek words, and you can put it. It's tis gar plen. Tis gar plen. And so if you have a situation this week, and you're like, oh, that's not what I can say, so what do you? You can just say, tis gar plen. Right? Tis God plan. You can just let it go. When you run into something that really doesn't matter, what do you say? So what? Tis God plan. So what? Some things are important. We address them. Other things, we let them go. We say, it's, that's not a big issue. I don't have to hold on to that. Sometimes we hold on to things so tightly and we hold on to so many things, it just causes us to wig out and we just, we just can't handle it. I've got to separate those things out. How do I discern what I need to hold on to? I have some maybe three easy questions. First is, if, will it matter right now? So what? Will it matter right now? Is there, does it matter right now? 
Will it matter a hundred years from now? Will it matter a hundred years from now? How about this? Will it matter in eternity? When you think of the priorities of eternity, is this really going to matter? Is this going to be an issue that is going to be on the agenda of eternity? If not, so what? Stay focused. Let it go. If it's not important here today, so what? If it's not important when you're not here 100 years from now, let it go. So what? And if it isn't something that's going to consume our thought and our, and our focus and stuff in eternity, then you know what he's saying? He says, so what? And you let it go. Paul says, Paul says, what's going on here in this particular situation? He says, it's not going to be important. He says, so what? Car breaks down. So what? How many of you can say that? <laughs> Don't like your job? So, so. You, let it, you let it steal your joy. Talk about joy here. Are you going to let, let the things that are going on in your life steal that internal celebration that comes from Christ? Things that don't matter. Is it so why? We choose not to ask why, but we say, God, what are you doing here? What are you, what's, what's the purpose? And then for all of those things that, that fill our mind and our day and our, and our attention, we separate them out the things that matter from the things that don't. And the things that don't matter, we just say, you know what? So what? I'm going to stay focused on what Christ has me to stay focused on. Second truth for today is this. With regard to joy, happiness is based on happiness. Joy is based on Jesus. I'm going to stay focused on Jesus, his purposes for my life, what he's doing, all of the other things that aren't going to matter today, 100 years from now, or even in eternity. I'm going to let them go. I'm not going to focus on how I feel in the moment, but I'm going to focus on the things that, that have true and lasting value. Those are the things that I focus on Christ, and that will give me true joy. Happiness based on happiness. We've heard that before. It's good to be happy. We don't like to be sad. Sometimes we are sad. But joy is based on the confidence that we have that God is God, and he will work through all of the things that go on in our life. I want to close with this. And I'm simply going to call this the ultimate joy. That joy. But I, I think Paul gives us in this chapter what I'm going to call the ultimate joy. Ultimate joy. Now, there are a handful of people who live in ultimate joy. And if we're talking about taking, taking next steps in our relationship with Jesus, then this is, this is what we aim towards. This is what we move towards. As we learn to ask the right question, more and more often, as we learn to let go of things and say, kiss our plan, so what? To the things that we need to let go, we move closer and closer to what we're going to, what I'm just going to simply call the ultimate joy. And the ultimate joy is found in verse 21. It's on the beginning in front of your program this morning. And it's very simply this. It's for me to live as Christ and to die as King. That, that our move and our growth and spiritual spiritual maturity direction is to get to the place where in my daily life all of that is about Jesus. Living for him, making choices that honor him, serving him, sharing about him, glorifying him in the things that I do and the things that I say. Whatsoever I do, whether in word or deed, I do it for the glory of God. For me to live as Christ, to die is what to gain. If I draw my last breath here on earth, I know it's only gain. I don't leave anything behind. I don't leave any regrets behind. Why? Because as I lived, more and more I lived for Christ. And now that I've drawn my last breath, now that I'm gone, I'm in his presence, and there can't be anything better than that. That's the ultimate joy. To be able to look at your day, each and every day, and to say, boy, today, in a way that I never had before, I lived for Christ. And if I put my head on the pillow tonight and my eyes don't open, boy, that was a good day. That was a good day. So where are you at? Where are you at today? 
For some of you, you're, you're going to struggle. You're struggling with joy today, and the reason is because you've never met the source of true joy, and that is Jesus Christ. You have been relying to this point on happenings to make you happy. And happiness is good, but happiness does not last because it's based on happenings and how I feel about those happenings. But true and lasting joy, eternal celebration, is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's found in Him. And so if you're here today and you do not know Jesus, or would like to find out what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to come up after the service. There's people here who would love to talk to you about that. But I can say one thing for sure that, that involves all of us. And that, and that is this, that all of us will endure and will experience a measure of suffering, of challenge, of pain, of, of, of dysfunction, of consequence from, from lapsy choices. Being on the wrong end of, of people who, who did the wrong thing and then we find ourselves living with those, with those consequences. And we have a choice to make, Paul says. He says, Paul, Paul says, joy is available to you. And I have found joy in the midst of my suffering here in, in jail. I thought life was in Rome was going to be one thing, and here it's something completely different. But I have chosen, rather than to ask the question, why, and to focus on me, I'm going to ask the question, why, and focus on thee. And seek to be a part of what God is doing and His purposes in my life and in these situations. And as I walk through that and experience things during the day, maybe you need to learn to let some things go. And to say, you know what? That really doesn't matter all that much. So what? Tis our plan. I just let it go. And let go. Wherever you're at today, may it be that you will you think through, maybe this week through part of the devotional or whatever, that you'll think through what your next step is and then embrace that in Jesus.